All right, we're going to be answering three letters here from the same person. And um, if you for, please forgive me for wearing a coat. Right now it's a little chilly in here in the office. I have my winter hat on too. But uh, I've been running the electric heaters, but it's pretty cold outside, snowing right now. So chilly day. So that's why I'm wearing my coat in the office. Question number one, two Bible questions here. Uh, I'll get past the regular stuff he says there. It says, I have a new question about a salvation issue that I would like to bring up and see what your thoughts are on this. Acts 16.31 says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So the believe-only crowd will often bring up this verse as a proof text to show that no prayer is required for salvation. I saw you and Brother Jacob Thompson talking about the book he wrote called the Roman 10, Romans 10 Controversy. I purchased the book, and that verse is talked about in the book. And the response to that verse is good. All they have to do is read the next verse. It clearly says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. So it does seem extremely clear that Paul pulled him and his family aside after telling him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then told them what the word of the Lord is, which from my understanding is Romans 10, 9 through 13. But the problem that I see is that people in the only believed crowd We'll try to say that those verses are saying two different things. Romans 10.8 says that the word of faith, whereas Acts 16.32 says the word of the Lord. They will try to say it is two different things. So my first question is, is, this a, is there a verse that is clearer as to what the word of the Lord is so we can show um, them that the word of the Lord and the word of faith are the same thing? Hopefully this makes sense as to what I'm trying to say. The word of faith and the word of the Lord are the same thing. Um, I mean, you could go through a lot of different scriptures there. Again, you know, do your word studies on that. Um, <clears throat> but um, I'll give you a couple here that come to my mind. Um, what you have that's making a lot of the problem here, I just saw one, one of you commented today about this. I saw the comment. And somebody said that this hyper-dispensationalism stuff is just destroying Bible doctrine. And that's exactly correct. Um, dispensational belief is fine. It's in line with Scripture. Definitely not a problem. I'm a dispensational preacher. But non... Well, okay, non-dispensational. No, hyper-dispensationalism. Non-dispensationalism non is a problem too. Um, but... Hyperdispensationalism is where you have um, somebody actually cuts up what Paul wrote. See, a dispensationalist would say, well, the doctrine that's primarily there for the body of Christ today would be in the Pauline epistles. But then you have a hyperdispensationalist that says, no, they go even further and say, there were things that Paul wrote that don't even apply to the church, which is nonsense. Absolute total nonsense. But the fir yeah, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. There, there you have the word of God. Um, Ephesians chapter 6. Um, <clears throat> verse 16 Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Um, so again, faith there is tied into the word of God. Um, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I mean, there's so many different ways that you could explain this thing. But the word of faith, what it's talking about there is the word of God, put your faith in what's written there. So in Acts chapter 16, they're not saying to him, you know, this, the jailer there, um, he's coming in a repentant, broken state. Okay, so there's no need to re preach repentance because he's already broken. The guy's going to kill himself, basically. And Paul says, you know, don't do it yourself any harm. And he comes in trembling and falls down and says, what must I do to be saved? Okay, he's ready for salvation. You don't have to say, if you died today, do you know for sure, you know, no. The man's ready for salvation. All right, so um, again, hyper-dispensationalists, they'll go through the Bible and they'll just cut it all to pieces 
and they'll make it teach things and this and well there's nothing you know the word repent doesn't appear in the book of john you know you get that type of thing and um ultimately brethren you just have to get to a point with some of these people where you just say a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject All right let me show you that verse real quick it's in the book of titus um you know, it's not our job to save everybody or to straighten everybody out. There are some people that you just have to walk away. Titus chapter 3, verse um, 9 through 11, we'll read those three verses. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing he, that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Um, condemned of himself. <laughs> That's an interesting statement right there. People that go to hell actually condemn themselves. People send themselves to hell. Think about that. Um, nobody that went to hell ever went there because God predestinated them for hell. They send themselves. They condemn, they're condemned of themselves. Always remember that. Question number two in the letter here. I've heard people on YouTube that say it's believe only and then the way they try to defend this position is by saying that there are so many verses on believe with the heart than to, that, than to confess with the mouth. So my question is uh, this, why does it seem like this is the case? I could be wrong, but I think I have an answer for this, so let me know if you think this is biblically sound. The reason there seems to be more verses that just say believe rather than believe and confess is because 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 is what we have to believe to be saved, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's so extremely important to believe this for salvation. That is what you are trusting in to keep you out of hell. Nothing else. So we see lots of verses that emphasize believe, but Romans 10, 9 through 13 is how to apply that belief to yourself. Exactly. If this isn't correct, please let me know. Thank you for your help. I look forward to hearing your answer. Yeah, you're, you have it exactly right. Um, don't really need my help. <laughs> the Lord has revealed that to you. Um, very well said, actually. So that's the first letter there. Um, again, you know, it's the simplicity of Jesus Christ, of the gospel. People try to complicate things. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Another letter here from the same guy. Hello again. I, I wanted to also write you a letter about a different topic that seems to be a big issue among Christians in general. The issue is about eternal security. I believe in eternal security 100%, but often I am attacked in a, with objections that I'm not sure how to respond to. The objections go like this. If you believe in once saved, always saved, then you are giving people a license to sin. On the other or the other objection I get comes in the form of a question. They will say, "What if a man who is wicked and an evil person, for example, someone who is a pedophile and murderer, hears the gospel, he truly gets saved, and then years later he falls back into the same wicked sin? Is that man still saved?" Um, they will say, "There is no way he is still saved." But I have uh, come to two conclusions to this, and if I'm wrong, please let me know. Firstly. If a person hears the gospel and truly gets saved, he is saved regardless of what sin he commits in the flesh. I would reference Colossians 2.11 as proof of this for this, but with that being said, I would also add that because of the two natures of man, it is possible for him to not yield his members unto the Holy Spirit. Uh, therefore, over time, the more and more he yields unto himself over to the flesh, he becomes worse and worse in his sin until he is back where he started. Is he still saved? Yes, but he will pay for what he has done in the flesh, and God may even take him home early as a result of, his, of being a, a bad testimony. Secondly, is it, it is possible that the man never really got saved at all because with doing things like that there should be a grieving from the Holy Ghost. He may have just said some empty prayer because he thought that the prayer saved him or had some kind of head belief, but not heart belief. He never really had a repentant heart toward his sinful condition. And that's why he went back to his old wicked lifestyle. They, those are the two possibilities I would give, but if I'm wrong, please let me know. Hopefully you can make a detailed video about this subject as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, the uh, 
I've dealt with this thing for many years, and um, they'll do this thing of the hypothetical situation. What if there was a man, and what if he got saved, and what if, and, and uh, okay, that's not that's not proof of anything. In order to actually show a documented or or to prove anything, show me a documented case. All right, actually take me to somebody and say, okay, this guy here, whatever the case is, here's proof of somebody that made a profession of salvation. Um, here's what they said, here's what they believed, here's what they did. Do you think that the guy genuinely was saved or not? Okay, I need an example. People write me and they say, Brother Brian, what do I do about such and such? My wife left me this, I'm having this issue here, this issue there. What should I do? I don't know. I have no idea. I would need to know more details. Right? I can't advise people just like I'm some kind of a God man that just kind of, I can see into your situation. There's somebody out there. Put your hand up to the screen and, and your wallet, you know, get the wallet out and send me money or something. Put your hand on my hand on the screen and I'll pray for your situation. I don't know. All right. Christianity, Bible believing Christianity is a logical, rational type of a thing. It really is. You can look and you can see, okay, tell me your testimony. Uh, something sounds a little bit weird there. How did you get into this? Uh, what you know? And you talk to the person. That's supposed to be there. I can't just you know deal with hypothetical situations. But in terms of the thing of eternal security, um, I'll show you two real good places here. Ephesians chapter 1. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, um, we'll start, I guess, in verse uh, 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when you get genuinely born again, the Holy Spirit, you know, He'll seal you and promise you an eternity, you know, that you get to heaven when you die. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Again, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the, unto the day of redemption. Um, go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, there's no question about eternal security in the Pauline epistles for a Christian in the church age. Um, you're sealed. When you truly are born again, when God saves you, again, if you're making just a mental, uh, you know, I, I made up my mind, I think I'm saved now or something, or even just I've prayed a prayer, um, but there's no changed life. Well, okay, then you probably didn't get saved. And again, I would ask somebody about that. I would take them through the scriptures. And Did you do this? Did you believe that? Whatever, but it's I can't do that stuff online. It just gets ridiculous. People lie to me all the time. They have for years. Um, okay, Ephesians chapter. I'm sorry, First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen and twenty. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Another key important thing here. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. All right? Um, if you defile the temple here, the temple of the Holy Ghost, God will destroy you. All right? Um, just, you know, I'm doing these things ad lib. I'm trying to think of, you know, different verses here in my mind. But the whole point is, again, what happens if the guy is a pedophile and a whatever else, and he gets born again, and later, many years later, he does it again or something. Well, don't you think God could stop that from happening? Um, not by overthrowing the man's will, but by getting rid of the guy before he does it. And, you know, the Lord, before, I mean, it's not going to be just all of a sudden, one day, boom, he does pedophilia again, and without ever thinking about it before then. No, there would be actions, you know, there would be thoughts that would start to lead towards an action, and the Lord would take the time to say, okay, boom, you're coming home. You know, you're messing around there or whatever. Um, 
you know, people forget that God is the one who saves. God has a big part in salvation. Uh, eternal security is not a license to sin. And uh, the people that believe in works salvation, they're the ones that come out with that stuff. You get the papists, they'll come out with that type of a thing. Eternal security is a license to sin. Why? Because they know that they can work their own little system there. Catholics especially are really good at this. They have the auricular confession that they go into the little booth and they, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned, talking to some pervert pedophile on the other side of the little screen there. And, um, you know, I can do some, a bunch of sins and pervert, you know, priest pervert over here, uh, he'll forgive me for my sins and tell me what penance I need to do or whatever else. And so I go do the penance and I can go out and do my sin. See, that's what Roman Catholicism is. You go do a bunch of wicked stuff knowing that I can just go in and do my little penance thing, confess it, penance, and then I can go back and do it all over again. That's why the Lord was rebuking the Jews there, the Pharisees and things, because that's what they were doing. They were using the law of Moses to live in perpetual sin. As long as you can do, you know, pay the little fine or you know, put some money in the offering plate and whatever else, you know, that's, that's good. That's what organized religion is all about, brethren. So those of us that are genuinely born again, um, sin is very grievous. Sin is a terrible thing that you, you're vexed by it. And there are some things, yes, you will struggle with sins for a little while, but there, there's a time when you will get a victory over a sin. Um, I struggled for a little while after I got saved with pornography because I, I was really a porn addict before I got saved. Lord saved me and I was struggling with it. I'd feel like dirt if I looked at it. You know, and, and finally it was just this thing of I fought and fought and fought and prayed. And I finally, Lord gave me victory over, it, victory over it. And it just, my temptation, my desire for it went poof, gone. And see, again, a workspace salvationist doesn't understand that. They don't understand that new birth that comes upon you and the Holy Spirit moving within you. And if some guy would be a pedophile and actually get born again, um, that desire would go away. So you're not going to go back to it again. But the hypothetical... <laughs> whatever. Um, <clears throat> finally, the third letter that was sent to me from this particular guy here. Hello, Brother Brian. I recently wrote you two letters on the subject of Romans 10, 9 through 13. I'm not sure if you were planning on making a video about them as of the time of writing this letter. I haven't seen a response to them on your channel. But if you have made a video responding to my last two letters and just haven't uploaded them yet then feel free to disregard this letter after you read it. But the reason for me writing you this time is because in my last two letters, I don't feel like I was absolutely clear on what I was trying to say, so hopefully I can be more clear in this letter. When it comes to Romans 10, 9 through 13, one of the main questions I had was, are you saved by just believing on what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you? Is just the belief enough to be saved, or is it salvation by both believing in what Jesus did to save you and confession with the mouth, calling upon the name of the Lord. The reason I'm asking this is because there's a pastor on YouTube I mentioned in my last letter that says confession and prayers adding works to, to salvation. His stance is that if you are insisting that salvation is by both believing on the Lord Jesus and confession with the mouth, then you have a faith plus works gospel and you are lost, but the verse clearly says call upon the name of the Lord. All right, let me just stop there for a minute. Uh, faith and works salvation... Works never ends. You have to continually maintain that state of grace. You have to continually be that, you know, good works type of a thing. That's what works salvation is. Confession with the mouth, even if that was part of what people would preach, belief and confession with the mouth and that's salvation, confession with the mouth is not work. It does, I mean, it's, it's really just insane ignorance is the whole thing. Because if you're saying confession with the mouth is a work, but belief is not, well, belief takes work as well. <sighs> These guys get people so messed up. The other question I wanted to ask you is this. Uh, is this. You would agree that prayer is not a work and that the prayer doesn't save you. So then does this mean that the prayer is the catalyst? In other words, your prayer isn't what saves you, but Every relationship starts with a point of communication, so you are letting God know you need help. If this is the correct view, please let me know. I have struggled with the, this issue for the last two months and would like some clarity and victory over this subject. Hopefully, I will hear from you soon. Bless, God bless, and thank you for your help. 
taken me a long time to get to it because just that's the nature of being in full-time ministry um, and being the only one that does this work. Okay, I don't have a team of video editors or a team of people that answer emails or a team of people that do my video uh, work and write my notes for me and write my books for me and whatever. Um, I'd like to write more books, but that's the only one right now, right there, The Godhead Doctrine. Um, but this, this whole confusion, again, the devil comes in, he comes in very subtly, and he comes in and he says, Yea, hath God said. You know, the Bible right there, Romans chapter 10, it clearly says, let's go to the passage, Romans chapter 10, turn in your King James Bible to it, and look at the words. Okay, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right. So they say, well, you know, and these false prophets, these servants of the devil, they'll come in there and they'll say, well, yea, hath God said. It, it says call upon the name of the Lord, but it doesn't actually mean to call upon the name of the Lord. It's that's actually works. It's belief. Belief is all that you have there. And they'll go to show other verses where it says about belief. And then they leave out the fact that the people are calling upon the Lord. And they say, there's no scripture for people calling upon the Lord to be saved. And there's lots of them, um, which I've done in other studies, talked about in other studies. I'm not going to go through it all here. But I get so sick and tired of hearing this whole thing. Just go with the plain English, okay? Do you believe what's written in the Bible? Jesus died for your sins. He wasn't like Muhammad in that Muhammad stayed dead. Buddha stayed dead. Every pope stays dead okay except for the one that's coming up in the future the antichrist he'll come back to life for a little bit um jesus died for your sins he was buried like all other cult leaders but he rose again that's the difference between our savior and the saviors of the world out there the great teachers and philosophers jesus didn't stay buried all right so you are dead in trespasses and sins and you can be buried with Christ and raised up to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? You say, yes, I do. Okay, then what do you do next? God, I believe your word. You start talking to God. It's your first act of faith. You see? It's very simple. You're saved by God's grace through your faith. And how is your faith exercised? By confession with the mouth. Easy. You call upon the Lord to be saved. It's not difficult. But the devil's servants will come in and mess with it. And they'll come in and they'll tweak it. Well, actually, the, yea, hath God said. That's what they do every single time. And then they'll say, okay, now that you say that you've gotten saved, I hope that you don't believe in that damnable doctrine of once saved, always saved. Because you see, you have to continue to maintain good works. Let me show you some verses on that. And they'll go and they'll take other verses out of context and everything. And you go, oh, well, wait a second. Well, uh, there's a few things you just have to get figured out right away. And one of those is you can't save everybody. And there are some people that they're heretics and they condemn themselves with their own speech. And when you meet one of those people, just say, oh, sorry, uh, no. Somebody comes along and they say, well, actually, Romans chapter 10 is not for us. It's for the Jews. You know, okay, hyper dispensationalist. Bye-bye. See ya. No, no, let me explain to you. No, uh, it's okay. No, thank you. The Bible says that you're to flee, or, or excuse me, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But, you know, don't get in a conversation with Satan or one of his followers. If they're not open to, if they're not coming in a repentant state, you are under no obligation to convert them. Right? Because all that they will do is just leave you confused. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. It doesn't say sit there and continue to argue with the guy. Continue to watch his videos because you'll eventually you know, be ruined and shipwrecked. It doesn't say that. Reject them. Somebody comes along and they say, uh, you have no eternal security. That's just a license to sin. You have to continue to maintain good works. And you know, oh, oh, Okay, whoa, I know who you work for. Bye-bye. 
Oh, the Romans road will lead you to, to damnation. You know, prayer is a work. You say, oh, okay, goodbye. Uh, no, thank you. Well, I don't know, Brother Brian. I just, I feel the Lord's called me to just talk to these people. The uh, Lord hasn't called you to talk to heretics. Why? Because that would contradict his word. Reject them. Get away from them. Run away. Because if you don't, they're going to ruin you. Okay? So, um, take my advice on that, brethren. Uh, I've dealt with these people for years. Many years. Um, online, offline, I've dealt with them. Don't waste your time. Okay? Um, stick them a few times with the sword of the Spirit. Give them a few verses. And... There's no repentance there. There's no humbling of themselves and saying, well, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I, uh, whatever. Well, but let me show you this other, uh, you know. Bye-bye. Uh, Goodbye. I'm leaving now. You can continue in your heresy. I'm going away. Okay? Just that simple. That's going to be it for this video. See you in the next one.